Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. It's been a while, and no, I didn't get abducted by Bigfoot or space aliens. I just enjoyed a little rest and relaxation. You know, recharge my batteries and all that stuff. Did you miss me? Next time, take better aim. Well, when I got back from vacation, I ran into a little trouble with the new fuel injection. A combination of supply chain, software, and hardware glitches. Boy, this sounds like excuses. Let's just watch the video. Oh, and by the way, a big shout out to the Episode 13 Fan Club. You folks are awesome. If you want to become a member of the Episode 13 Fan Club, just leave a comment saying, Hey, Jimbo, where the heck is Episode 13? It's just that easy. All right, roll the video. Earlier this year, we upgraded our 420cc cement mixer powered street legal go-kart with the cheapest EFI kit on eBay. Now, the kit initially looked good and was super easy to set up, and before long we had the car back on the road. Well, the cheapo EFI kit had limitations, and one of the major issues we discovered was the kit was not compatible with a wideband oxygen sensor. So for the new folks on this channel, the wideband oxygen sensor is both a necessary sensor and can be used as a tool to tune the air-fuel ratio. You see, the wideband sensor is an integral part of tuning a do-it-yourself EFI system. Without it, tuning is infinitely harder, and who has time for that? So while we were successful in converting the engine over to EFI, ultimately the system is not going to give us the performance we're seeking. And this is where the Speedduino NO2C makes its appearance. The Speedduino EFI, along with the Arduino Mega, is a great value and can be had for about 85 bucks. The NO2C is extremely small and is the go-to ECU for one, two, and even four-cylinder engines. Perfect for our application. As it turns out, fuel injection is easy. As a matter of fact, the hard part is igniting the fuel after it's injected in the engine. And this is where most people have trouble. So, in order to get the engine running today, we're going to focus on creating the spark that causes the explosions inside the engine. This time around, we're going to set up the ignition system a little bit different. First of all, we're changing from the Hall Effect type crank sensor to a VR type sensor. Also, we're going to finish off the ignition with a combination of a Ford ignition coil and a General Motors ignition module. So let's get started. The GM ignition module we're using is based on a part that has been around for well over 40 years. I guess first thing most folks notice is the unusual shape, and that's because it was designed to fit inside the distributor cap on a 1970s GM car. Anyway, the part is clearly labeled with W, G, C, and B. The W is the trigger ground, the G is the ignition trigger signal from the ECU. The C goes to the negative side of the ignition coil. And finally, the B will go to two places. The first is the positive side of the ignition coil, and it also goes to the ignition switch. So let's go through this again, but with more pictures. <laughs> Here I show the W and G going to the ECU. The W is basically grounded to the ECU, and that's fine. It doesn't pull any power. The G is connected to the ignition out on the ECU. And in this case, the signal coming out of the ECU will be a 5 volt pulse or a square wave. And as you can see, both the C and B go directly to the coil. It's important that you get the polarity of the coil correct because it will more or less work if it's wired backwards, but the current will be flowing in the wrong direction and that can cause problems. The C terminal is also wired to the ignition switch, or in most cases, the output of the main relay. In our application with the single cylinder engine and the tiny ignition coil, we can wire it directly to the ignition switch because this setup doesn't draw a lot of power. However, in almost all other cases, you want this wire to go directly to the main relay to get its power. Now, a couple of things I should probably mention. The GM ignition module wants to be mounted to a flat piece of aluminum for a heatsink, and one of the hold down screws needs to be connected to a ground from the engine block or a cylinder head. And finally, the module needs a layer of thermally conductive grease between itself and the heatsink. Now that's just one example on how to wire the ignition using the parts I selected. Now there are plenty of components that are available that are just as suitable. For example, this is an all-in-one ignition coil from a GM LSV8. Now these are cheap and plentiful, and as a bonus it has the igniter built in. Now in case you're wondering why I didn't use one, well, no reason, other than the Ford part probably uses a little less power. But like I said, there are lots of different ways to do this. I guess the most important thing to remember when selecting components is the documentation that's available. The two examples that I show are extremely well documented here in the US. And if you decide to use a part from say an Italian or French car, well it might be wise to also speak that language. So for the crank trigger system, we're going with a 36 minus one crank wheel and a VR type position sensor. Now, unfortunately, you can't buy these parts that'll just bolt right up to a 420cc cement mixer engine, and that's a shame. I reckon we're gonna have to do some light fabrication. 
The crank wheel we're going to be using is off a of Ford 4.6 liter V8, and it turns out Ford stuff is perhaps more suitable for a lawnmower engine than they are for actual car engines, or at least that's the way it seems. Anyway, the wheel comes close to fitting the crankshaft and only needs a tiny bit of trimming. Once we adjust the inside diameter of the crank wheel, we can mount it to this 36mm shaft collar. Well, let's play some hillbilly music as Jimbo makes a Ford part fit a lawnmower engine. So well, that was a quick and easy job. The shaft collar was drilled and tapped for 832 fasteners and that works out to be close to 4mm in case you're wondering. I have to say I'm pretty excited about the crank position sensor. Yep, this thing looks like it was made for a lawnmower engine, but it ain't a Ford part. My best guess it's from a 6 cylinder Jeep engine. You never really know what you're getting when you buy a Jeep. I mean most of the older ones were mutts from the factory. Anyway, it had this pretty decent weather pack connector on it, but I clipped it off because we're using Deutsch type connectors on this build. Looks like we have some good mounting points on the engine block and that'll come in handy. Unfortunately this crank position sensor doesn't quite fit the mounting points on the engine block, but that doesn't matter. We'll make it fit because that's what we do. Off camera I fabricated the bracket that will mate the Jeep part to the lawnmower engine and overall it's a very tidy package. Now here's something interesting. The holes on the engine block that we'll be using to mount the bracket are threaded for 3 8 by 16 fasteners. I guess I'm not too surprised they use the imperial threads, but most of the time when they do this, it's fine thread. So fast forward a little bit and the whole crank trigger system's mounted. The gap between the wheel and the sensor was set to 20 thousandths of an inch, or half a millimeter. Let's see what kind of signal this VR sensor generates. Over here I have an oscilloscope set up, and I realize not everyone can read or interpret the signal from an oscilloscope, so here's a quick lesson. Right now the scope is set up so the vertical grid equals 5 volts per division. So from this horizontal line, that's 5 volts. And that would be 10 volts. You get the idea. Let's go ahead and spin the crank wheel and see what we get. Now keep in mind the crank wheel hasn't been locked in position yet, so it can spin freely. Alright, well that's a nearly perfect sine wave. It's really clean and you couldn't ask for anything better. So it looks like we're generating about 12 volts AC at low speed, and that voltage will go a lot higher the faster we spin the wheel. That's both good news and bad. The good news is, we have a clean and very strong signal. The bad news is, that signal would likely blow up the speedwino in less than a millisecond. But all is not lost. The signal needs to be processed by this VR signal conditioner in order for the speedwino to use it. Now this signal conditioner takes the AC sine wave, chops it, and then reshapes it so it comes out the other end as a 5 volt DC square wave. And that's the type of signal the speedwino can use. And that's great news, but what's better is, this gizmo was actually made for a Speedwino and plugs right into this VR header. How awesome is that? So some of you folks are looking at that 36-1 wheel and are thinking, what the heck Jimbo, you plan on firing that spark plug 35 times per revolution? Uh, no. You see, as I mentioned in episode 21, the crank trigger doesn't directly fire the ignition, instead it provides a time reference for the ECU. Now the ECU will fire the ignition based on a prediction of where it thinks it's at according to the elapsed time between pulses from the crankshaft sensor. 
Or in other words, the ECU more or less guesses. But it's a highly educated guess, and it's guaranteed bullseye every time. All right, well, I feel a lot of you folks just started typing comments saying that the ECU doesn't guess. Well, let's look up the word prediction. Ah, uh, okay. We have forecast. Oh, and right here we have the word guess. So predictive ignition timing, which all modern cars have, is pretty much the same as guessing. Now I know it's an extreme example of wordplay, but the point is to break away from the thought that the ignition is somehow triggered directly from the crank sensor. Of course, we're talking about modern computer-controlled ignition systems, not the old-school mechanical systems. Anyway, the ECU really ain't got much to do as far as fuel calculations. Eh. It runs through a few formulas and updates the solution every few microseconds, but basically it's just waiting around and checking its Facebook or whatever. Predictive timing requires that the ECU get interrupted every time it receives a pulse from the crank position sensor, and this of course is called an interrupt. You computer guys and gals know what I'm talking about. Anyway, when the crank wheel passes under the sensor, this annoying interrupt stops the ECU from whatever it was doing and causes it to record the elapsed time it took for the crank wheel to advance one tooth. Then the ECU can go back to whatever it was doing. And it does this 35 times per revolution, or 137,000 times per minute at wide open throttle. Look at me, look at me, look at me! So at any given moment, the ECU knows exactly how much time it takes for the crankshaft to rotate 10 degrees, or one tooth. And with this information, the ECU can calculate, or guess, the exact angle of the crankshaft position. It's all math, and that's something computers do well. So what about the missing tooth? Well, the missing tooth is a trick they use to establish a known position in the rotation of the crankshaft. It's kind of like a start bit, or even a reset bit. When the missing tooth passes under the sensor, it takes double the time to generate a signal, and of course the ECU can spot this right away. Let me give you an example of how the missing tooth is used. If we place the missing tooth 90 degrees before top dead center, and then tell the ECU that's where it's at, well, the ECU can then calculate the exact crankshaft angle with respect to top dead center. All the ECU needs to know at this point is when to fire the ignition, and that information comes from the ignition lookup table. So with a bit of math and some hard data, the spark plug will fire exactly when it's supposed to. Now that's the explosion we wanted at the beginning of the video, and like I said, fuel injection's easy, it's the ignition stuff that's complicated. The 28mm throttle body from the old fuel injection system is something I want to keep for now, but I have some concerns. You see, the sensor attached to the throttle body is not very well documented. So this thing has a MAP sensor, a throttle position sensor, an IAT sensor, or intake air sensor. The MAP sensor we don't care about, because the Speedwino has one built in, and the Speedwino one will measure boost. It's the throttle position sensor and the IAT sensor that has me concerned. So let's take this apart and have a look. Well, not really much to see. Here's the IAT sensor, which is just a thermistor, now, here's the port for the MAP sensor, but like I said before, we don't really care about that sensor. Now, the throttle position sensor is definitely odd. Right away, I can see it's not a standard potentiometer type sensor. Um, it kind of looks like technology from an extraterrestrial spacecraft, or at least I don't recognize how this actually works. Looks like it has a magnetic sensor or something. Hmm, this calls for reinforcements. Yeah, some caffeine will get the thinker working a little better. Why is this even a question? All right, let's see. Well, after some digging and probing, the IAT sensor ain't gonna work. You see, there's a bunch of electronic stuff inside this module, and the IAT sensor has some internal connections that are going to cause problems. On the other hand, the throttle position sensor will work, but it's going to need 12 volts on the input to give us a variable 0 to 5 volts on the output. It's doable, and we really don't have a choice, so let's make it happen. Off camera, I went ahead and made a harness, and guess we're ready to do some testing. Let's look at the throttle position sensor first. Yeah, it's hard to get too excited, but it works just fine. Let's see if the ignition works. Yup.
I was able to salvage the coolant temperature sensor from the old fuel injection system. And for the air intake temperature sensor, I'm going to use one from a Honda Civic. So it was a struggle, but we got the new crank position sensor onto the cement mixer engine. The only thing we need to do now is align the crank wheel and lock it in place. Probably easier said than done, but let's give it a try. As it turns out, there's just enough room to install a degree wheel in the space between the clutch and the transmission adapter. Well, we got the degree wheel in and we went through the process of locating top dead center. If you're interested in how this is done, check out episode 21. Anyway, with the engine now at top dead center and the missing tooth under the sensor, all we need to do now is rotate the crank wheel 9 teeth clockwise. And that'll put us at 90 degrees before top dead center or 270 degrees after top dead center. So now that the crank wheel is located in the right position, it needs to be locked into place. Now the collar clamp that I'm using is more than adequate for securing the crank wheel. I know some folks had concerns in previous videos. Okay, so at this point the wheel is still loose, but no worries, all we really need to do is cinch up the two bolts that hold the wheel to the collar clamp, and that should do it. So while I had the car apart, we went ahead and removed the pull starter, and this is to help the engine run a little bit cooler. If you want, check out episode 24 where we did some cooling experiments and removing the pull starter actually makes a big difference. Now while we're here, let's take a minute and talk about cooling. I do read the comments and a lot of folks have suggested that I build some ducting to help direct the air right to the engine. And that's a great idea, except I can't do that right now. You see the space we would need for the ducting is reserved for the supercharger. So right now there's no point in fabricating any ducting if it's going to get in the way in the near future. Anyway, I hope that clears that up. Hopefully running the engine without the recoil should make a huge difference like it did in the experiments. But that remains to be seen. So fast forward a little bit and a new EFI harness is installed in the car. The new harness was built long enough so the Speedwino ECU can be mounted inside the car and that'll keep it from getting wet. I guess we pretty much covered all the difficult EFI stuff except for the wideband. And well, the wideband was covered in a previous episode and nothing has changed since then. Now if you're interested, we're using an AEM 30-300 wideband that has a 0-5 to volt analog output. Standard stuff really. The last thing we need to do before we can start the engine is deal with the fuel tank mounts. So if you've been following this video series, you know the fuel tank mounting bracket has taken a beating and pretty much breaks every 50 miles. This bracket has been welded numerous times and even reinforced, but for some reason it keeps failing. I'll admit this bracket was a bit flimsy when it was originally fabricated, but damn it's led a hard life. Now the other bracket for the fuel tank is very robust and hasn't failed yet, but the bolts holding it to the transmission have snapped a few times. So there's that. A bunch of folks have suggested that I try mounting the tank on rubber isolators, so that's the plan. These rubber isolators were originally designed to be used as motor mounts on a generator. The thought is, they should be plenty strong to hold the fuel tank in place, but I guess we'll see. Now this rubber mount is where the failed bracket actually gets connected. Well, that bracket's trashed, and I'll have to fabricate a new bracket to support the tank, and that'll attach to this rubber mount. Alright, the fuel tank's in place and it looks like we're ready to make some noise. But first, if you're new to the channel, let me do a quick recap of what we got going on here. Right here's the fuel pump that we got from a cheap eBay EFI kit. And there's the return line in case you're wondering. The silver box houses the ignition module. The throttle body we're using is from the cheapo eBay kit. You can check out episode 19 for more info on that. Oh, and here's the Honda Civic IAT sensor. It'll work for now. The coil is from a Ford 4.6 liter V8, and so is the 36-1 crank wheel. The crank position sensor, I believe, is from a six-cylinder Jeep engine, but I'm not exactly sure. Of course, the engine we're using is a 420cc Predator cement mixer engine, so there's that. Let's take a look at the Speedwino inside the car. So there's the AEM 30-300 Y-band stuck to the dashboard, and the Speedwino NO2C is housed in that black box on the floor. Now most of this stuff will get tucked behind the glove box, but for now I want to have easy access to it. Now everything is wired in with Deutsch type connectors, and that makes working on each system or subsystem pretty easy. Alright, well that's about it for the tour. Well, let's see if this thing will run. Uh, that never happens.
So I double and triple checked all the settings, but I didn't find any real issues. Hmm. Anyway, I gave it another shot. Oddly enough, the problem was the Speedduino wasn't injecting any fuel, and I thought fuel injection was easy. Anyway, I headed over to the Speedduino forum and picked up a bass tune for a similar setup, and then did some edits to suit my application. Let's see if we can get it to run now. Not too shabby. This thing actually sounds like a real Honda now. Go figure. Now the fuel tank somehow managed this 520 minutes of idling, so things are looking real good. Okay, so after some basic tuning, the engine runs absolutely fantastic, certainly a lot better than I expected, but of course I did encounter some problems. Now, the janky laptop that I'm using keeps losing communication with the Speedduino. Now, I've pretty much tried everything like a new USB cables and adjusting the buffers and whatnot, but ultimately the problem seems to be in the laptop. It'll lose communication whether the engine's running or not. So I bit the bullet and bought another laptop on eBay. Unfortunately, as I edit this video, the laptop hasn't arrived yet and I need it in order to drive the car. So I'm afraid the test drive is gonna have to wait. And I promise I'll get the next video up as soon as possible. So in the meantime, let's go ahead and look at something that came in the mail. So while I was on vacation, this package arrived and sat on my front porch for about a week and a half. Well, it got rained on and the neighbor's dog probably tried to eat it or something like that because the box was totally destroyed when I arrived back home. It still had the mailing label on it, but I didn't find a note. But like I said, the box was shredded and that may have gotten lost. Regardless, big thanks to Jonathan for sending a random package. I went ahead and got a PO box so any future packages will arrive without bite marks. And if you're interested, the address is in the description. Now let's try to figure out what this is. Now I've owned a handful of Volkswagens, BMWs, and Mercedes in the past, and this looks like older German technology to me. Let's get this out of the box and take a better look. All right, well this is definitely German. Right here is the CIS fuel distributor, and it looks like it's for a four-cylinder engine. Okay. Looks like we got a bunch of hoses and a thingamajig. You know, I wonder if this is also part of an intercooler or something. Let's open it up. One thing I noticed about older German stuff is they like to make everything out of steel. Now the new stuff, especially on Volkswagens, is all plastic and it doesn't last very long. Oh, okay, well this looks like an air filter. So this is more or less a mechanical fuel injection system and it's very clever as far as engineering goes. In simple terms, this is a mass airflow meter that's directly coupled to a fuel distributor and the fuel flow is automatically regulated depending on the flow of the air through the apparatus. Well, it might be a little bit too big for the 420cc engine, but we'll find a use for it, I'm sure. And again, thanks Jonathan for sending this. Next up is the first package to arrive at the PO box. And this one's from uh, Dangerous Dave, Sort of sounds like a dangerous person. Let's see what he sent. Oh, it's a book. Hmm, someone thinks I need some learning. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> this is perfect. I guess the garden gnome problem is bigger than I thought. Let's see. Are you at risk? Wow, this looks like a serious book. Suspicious activity. Yup. Now I've seen some weird stuff around here for sure. This book is chock full of information. This is really gonna be helpful. Thanks again, Dangerous Dave. Well, that's about it for today. And like I said, I'll get the next video up as soon as possible. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.